Hey, good evening. Um, my name is Matt Batten. Uh, my Twitter handle is RedVon, like red teaming and uh, vulnerability research. And my talk is on .NET and uh, NVIDIA O'Days. So for .NET, obviously it's under uh, Microsoft and NVIDIA is NVIDIA for the GFE. And uh, I'll go more in depth to that. So the first slide, of course, I have to go about myself. Who am I? And that's my wife and my best friend and all my animals. Um, the animals are very important to me and they're crazy. Uh, so like I said, my Twitter handle is RedVon. My email, if you want to hit me up or ask me any questions. Uh, I enjoy having technical discussions or talking about whatever you like. And uh, the company I currently work at is Six Gen. I had seven jobs in two years and I was not happy. And I've been working at Six Gen for almost three years now. And I don't plan on going anywhere else. And I'm surrounded by the brightest and some of the smartest people I've ever met. And I've never been the smartest person in a room. I'm very grateful that um, Ethan, our CEO, took a chance on me. And I'm, you know, I'm still working here and I love it. Um, so yeah, I'm a husband, red teamer, dog dad. I'm a Marine Corps vet. I was in signals intelligence. And um, I got out and I've been doing this. And I'm also a cat dad. So what we're going to be covering is the thought process, the tools, the actual examples and closing thoughts. So the reason I put it out like this is because I want people to be able to watch this talk and then actually understand on, and reason, you know, their way on how to actually find vulnerabilities. It's not when, when you watch this and by the end of it, you should realize, oh, wow, that actually was not that hard. Like, you know, I got paid for the .NET O'Day Privest by Microsoft. You know, like that's real. And like the, the NVIDIA one, they acknowledge it now. There's going to be a link at the end. I got the CVE for that. And um, any, I think anyone could find it with a basic understanding. And after watching this and um, reading some other researchers, you know, work, which I'll go into. So the thought process, there's so many different ways to do vulnerability research, right? There's, you know, code analysis, the static analysis, dynamic. Um, and then there's the behavioral, which, you know, I would say that uh, I'm more right now behavioral analysis where I do, I do things. And I, I watch weird stuff happening and then I work backwards. Eventually I get to the code analysis portion, but I start behavioral, which is not as technical, I would think, and say someone might disagree, but um, I'm trying to get more into driver O'Day exploitation and everything. Um, so I'm really motivated at that right now because I, I really want some kernel driver stuff because I just, I want some O'Day Privess on Windows 10. It's like my big thing right now I'm going after, but that's more starting out static and then working the other way. Um, great researchers uh, who published their work got me to where I am now, such as James Horshaw, which whom I really, you know, I really look up to. He's, um, I would love, I'd probably like the next step in my, my dream goal would be sitting next to him for two weeks and just listen to ramble or talk about, um, how he gets to where he is, where even <laughs> I reread some of his blog sometimes and I still only understand half. So I just need him to explain to me like I'm dumb. And then, um, Matt Nelson, uh, his research Enigma is what he goes by. And, uh, he has a great blog that I like reading and it helps find some vulnerabilities as well. And, um, my closing thought on like the thought process is like, why does this matter to a company or a government? Like why, like if you're watching this, you're not a vulnerability, vulnerability researcher, why should this matter to you? And, you know, I say to that, like, um, the solar winds, um, issue, and there's been so many issues, but that's just the most, like one of the most recent where, Companies who were patched and up to date <laughs> ended up being vulnerable, while companies who fell behind and did not patch properly on time ended up, you know, missing that. Um, obviously, there's other vulnerabilities when they don't patch on time, but um, every time you install new software, you update software, something's different, you end up introducing more things onto the system, into the network. And, and you know, it, it can always be more vulnerabilities, there could always be more issues. And, um, you know, or it's, maybe it's more secure and completely locked down. But from what I've seen, whenever, you know, new software is updated or new software is added or something's updated, there's been more issues than fixes normally. And then, uh, the tools that we're going to talk about, there's a lot of tools. Um, there's more like nitty gritty, like Ida pro and Ghidra and things like that. If you actually um, want to do some static analysis, like reverse engineering. Um, but for this, and that's why I'm gonna say it's simple and it was fun and easy is a just process monitor, you know, so windows system internal suite tool, um, you can just see what's going on and it shows, you know, the API calls and everything. 
And then uh, James Forshaw's tools, he actually made his own tools, so, you know, super legit, um, like create sim link, uh, like create hard link, things like that. And I'll, I'll talk about that later on. You'll see it. And then um, having virtual machines, understanding how they work, um, you know, ha having VMs, just be able to reboot them and keep your machine up helps a lot. Uh, if you test your own host machine at home, though, you'll probably end up finding a lot of vulnerabilities from um, things I'm going to talk about from random software you've installed or downloaded. So uh, here's Procmon. This is just what it looks like on your screen. I'm sure a lot of people have seen this, but a lot of people don't know that use it, which you know I find fascinating that you can actually uh, enable boot logging, where if you do enable boot logging and then you restart your computer while keeping Procmon open, it actually will show you everything that happened up to the point of your computer booting up, or like when you open up Procmon. So it's all those services and schedule or all those services and tasks that started during the boot process. And you can go and see like what DLLs are getting called, what files are being created, things like that, and seeing if there's any way that you can um, bypass or elevate or do something interesting. Um, obviously they're locking down on that and they're doing their best, but there's been some really funny ones at my previous talk because the NVIDIA one just got disclosed uh, the other day. I couldn't talk about it, but I talked about a bypass UAC O'Day which was just a DLL that was getting called a system. Um, I think it was like a, it was a um, process create or load process or yeah, I think it was a process create where it just, it was just calling the, uh, the DLL, you know, it was like some API legacy DLL that ended up getting called. Um, but for, so for this, you, you can reboot that. And obviously the filters are um, some of the most important. So you'll, you'll see here that it has like, Reg open key, reg load key. These are some of the ones I look at. This isn't what I always use. This is just an example. Um, you can see process start. I think that's actually what was called, I believe, for the bypass UAC, not the process create. I believe it was process start. I can't remember. Maybe it was, uh, it might have been load image. Um, but anyways, a uh, bunch of filters you have. It does different things. Uh, create file is harder now because of some mitigations put in place by Microsoft. We'll talk about that. Um, I take out things like, um, I try to take out like integrity level, like medium and low. You can take it out or you can like, I filtered in integrity is high. Integrity is system include because, um, if I can get from, you know, if I can get a higher system from a medium integrity, non-admin user, then that's a, that's a privilege escalation, right? If somebody's a medium integrity with admin and I can get to high integrity without something popping up then, you know, that's a, that's a bypass UAC. That's still, you know, still worth something. That's still interesting and valuable. So um, I see a lot of people just looking for a system. There's still a lot of ways, you know, around that. But these are just some, some examples of filters. There's, you know, there's more out there. Um, you can talk about going to, but um, I would say filters are probably one of the most important things to learn about Procmon and understanding from other people's work, methodology, getting it together. So um, so this is the .NET local privilege escalation. So this actually affected like all of .NET, or I think most of the versions like going back, or maybe it was, um, it was the older one when I did it. Or it was, it, was a, it was actually the recent one, but I, I tested others going back and they all worked as well. And I found it really interesting where, um, so Microsoft, they did not give me a CVE, but they paid me. Um, I think it took them uh, almost a year uh, it was, it was really interesting. I emailed every now and then, but hey, they paid me eventually. Here I am. You know, I'm happy I got it. I wish I got a CVE. I've emailed them four or five times. I never got a response about a CVE. I don't understand how they could just pay me and not give me a CVE, but I guess money money's still nice, right? So I'm not going to complain too much, even though I'd really like a CVE, obviously. Anyways, um, so this is really important. So the path redirect, redirection mitigations, right? So the, they had, uh, I actually took this from uh, the Blue Hat talk, uh, a Microsoft employee gave, I believe, I believe it was a Microsoft employee. That was from his slides. I have the link at the end for his YouTube um, talk. But I thought it was an amazing talk. And uh, it actually it goes into like what, why mitigation is getting harder. Like when you, when you do create a junction, right? Um, they'll immediately mark it as a medium integrity level. So f for services that follow like the high, it's saying that it's going to, it's going to screw you over because you're going to hit medium. So now you can't just do basic junction to get that, that priv S you want, or even the, the, the temp see when it was temp was a huge, um, attack surface. Right. And now, 
due to mitigations Microsoft's putting in place, it's, it's getting harder to stay logical, which is why, like, I mean, there's always logical vulnerabilities, and the people like, you know, James Forshaw and others, they're, they're always going to find ways around it, and I hope I find a few more, but, um, you know, that's why I'm, I'm looking more at drivers now, because I think it'll be really fun and a little bit easier. Um, I say easier, we'll see, but um, I'm having a good time with it. So, so we're starting on the, the .NET. So the .NET... Um, LP or local privilege escalation. It was, it was really stupid. So I was sitting there and I was on my host machine and I was just running Procmon. I just filtered like I showed you earlier, but a little bit better where I did a create file and a query open stuff like that. And I did things running a system. I looked for, um, you know, name not found. And then I saw, because if something's not found, name not found, it's getting called a system and user writable directory, right? See user user. That's cool as the user and app data. That's a user writable directory. So anybody can write to that directory which means why, why is the DL being called a system in a directory that a user can write to? So that's the easy priv -S. But the issue is how many computers are affected by this? Is this just my host machine? Is this some stupid software that no one else uses in the world? Why does this matter? So I saw that happen. So then um, I, you know, I, I started working backwards through Procmon and I was wondering like, okay, this is getting called. Where is this getting called? So I click where the extensions.dll was I see the SVC host, but then I just took off all filters and then I walked backwards and I found out it was .NET. And, and you can see there the, the, the actual create file um, .NET tools, right? That shows as well, like, okay, it probably has something to do with .NET, even though it's, dot, it's not .NET, but you know, oh, okay, like that obviously stands out. So, so then you see, oh yeah, I should probably tell you like system integrity there, right? Path not found, name not found. Huh, it's really interesting. Name not found system.net, okay. So then I go, what happens if I just drop this DLL, right? This is working backwards. This is not the most technical. And so I could found this from the other way because they actually dug into the code, but this is just, okay, WPTS extensions.dll, there it is. I drop it in there and I have complete access to that directory, yep. See user app data local, and you'll see that, um, was it uh, full control? That's for, yeah, but you see desktop cool has full control, right? So it's, um, but desktop cool, so that's, he was an admin when he installed it. So this is where it gets weird. So right now it's just a bypass UAC, privass, because you go, okay, the person who can drop a file in there is, um, an admin, it was medium integrity and everything like, okay, you can do bypass UAC. If you're an admin, you drop it in there because it has to be the user who installed .NET, right? But you, you see, you see the permissions there where it says desktop, cool, allow full control and the admin. So then, then when we get here, I know it's really small, but there's, there's a load image. I know you see, it's the blue, but there's a load image WTS extensions .dll to CES, right? So that means as system, it ran the DLL, which means you get. That's a um, bypass UAC O day right there. But then you go, okay, well, is there any way this can actually be a privilege escalation? So then if you look here, I walked backwards through Procmon and then I realized this registry key was getting modified. And you can actually see that um, the way it's supposed to be is the path. So the environment variable, or it's the environment path, but HK users default environment. And the path here is supposed to be percent user profile percent app data local da 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 and then uh they made it path um c user cool so i was like man and then added on the dot net tool so i was like so when dot net is installed it modifies that path so when that service runs it's it's checking that path it's actually calling this path and instead of going to percent user profile percent app data it's going to the user who installed .NET, which you have to be an admin to install .NET, a uh, .NET, right? So right now it's still a bypass UAC, but then what installs .NET? Like what, what, what does install it? Boom, it's um, MSI file. So it's the installer. So see when is installer? That's where MSI files are when you're installing stuff, right? And um, it's it ends up being like because of that, I realized in the registry key, it checks the registry key path, and then it runs it. I wish I click forward already can go back but so for the dot msi file ends up when it's running it's it runs as integrity or it runs as the user you currently are so and then it modifies that registry key right the reg set value so it, there's a dot msi it goes okay well 
who can run the .msi file in CWinners installer. And that's why I did the eye cackles so you see that. CWinners installer, everyone can execute them, right? Read, execute, X. And you can do eye cackles, look at Microsoft documents, and um, get a better understanding of that. So you go, okay, anyone can run the, the .msi file. So then there's ways um, you can search for which MSI file it was. I ended up just running them all. Um, but you can actually do a like fine string search for DLLs and things like that. Um, there's a, there's a great talk. I gave his name at the end of, of a reference. I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but he actually, he wrote up a really good blog where he actually talked about my blog about this. Um, and, uh, he, his blog goes in such detail and his write ups amazing on, uh, he's like .NET spy and actually like went in and looked at the code level where I just did. Uh, like behavioral analysis and figured it out from randomly clicking and <laughs> being sporadic until it worked. Um, I'll see, I'll show his name at the end, but his write-up's amazing. If you go to the link, uh, he explains it really in depth, but, but the gist is here. Okay. So now to Oday privilege escalation exploit, because it goes, um, you, you work backwards. Okay. A deal is being called a system. Okay. It's being called a system. Where is it being called at? In a user writable directory. Okay, but only um, the user who I am, he's an admin, can write to that. So other users can't really write to it because it has to be this user specifically. Okay, well, why why is it calling in this path? Oh, this it's checking this registry key. What modifies the registry key? Oh, well, it's um, when .NET was installed. When .NET's installed. It's, it's, uh, it's calling this .msi file, which modifies that registry key. So then if a, whatever user runs the .msi file, modif it modifies that registry key with that user's name. So if it's a guest user or a basic user, then you just, you just run that MSI file, then place a DLL in there and then reboot the box and then you have, or restart the service or whatever. And then you have a system callback and that's an Oday privs. Right there. I'm clapping in my head. That's a lot. I know it's kind of, it's kind of a lot, but then, um, just going, going on to that and like something to add on, this is a uh, NVIDIA, the GFE LP, right? So local footage escalation where, uh, they, they just came this the other day. Uh, I couldn't talk about it the last talk, but I'm glad I can talk about it. this one where, um, this actually, you know, this can actually be an LPE and lead to code execution. And there's other things you can do with it. It's really simple. And when I show it, like this one's more simple than the .NET one. The .NET one's simple from like, you didn't have to go into assembly. You didn't have to use .NET spot. You didn't have to, you know, like I clicked my way through and just banged my head on the wall until I figured it out, which is, you know, like I'm, I'm getting more into assembly and like doing the drivers, but this is just showing like, man, like CVEs, like this is not that hard and it's not that crazy and anyone can do it. And I, I hope this motivates some people to go and do it where like, so for this one, um, okay. So I, that was the version of, um, GeForce experience I had right on uh, my box. I need to upgrade uh, my machine. I still had a nine, you know, I still, I still have a 970 to be honest. I definitely need to upgrade my, uh, graphics card. Um, if you're watching Nvidia, you hear me, but anyways, um, no, it's nice enough that they, they acknowledged, uh, acknowledged it and gave me the CV, but, uh, what stands out here is that, uh, so the operation set rename information file. And, um, I saw that it replaced one file to the other and, uh, Matt Nelson, I think, uh, actually has a great blog about it. And, um, there's a few others, but I, I remember it and I set my filters for stuff that other researchers have found. So this, this is really a collection of people who are smarter than me. And then I just, I, I patched them together to make my own methodology, which I think a lot of people do hopefully, but, um, so here's the proc money, uh, event information where. Uh, it actually shows, okay, the, the operations of the set rename information file, you know, it says success. And then you see the path, C program data, NVIDIA, da, 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 NV stream SVC, the file. Okay. And, um, it says file name old dot log, right? So you see that if you look up and down, so SSAS current dot log, SSAS old dot log. So replace if it exists true. So that's crazy. So in my head, I go, okay. If, um, this is running, so it's running as system, which you'll see on the next slide, but if it's running a system and I can just do a sim link on, um, on this where, um, and like Microsoft, their mitigations are like create file, right? 
injunctions and stuff like that. But like, I don't know about the operation for set rename information file. So I figured I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'll give this a shot on a, on a sim link from um, James Forshaw's tools. So if you look here, you'll, you'll see, okay, nvcontainer.exe, the set rename information file, there's a PID, cool. And we see that the path is getting called successfully. And we're seeing the details, the replace of exists true for that file name again. Okay, so then, so we know that the current .log replaces, or it replaces, the current .log is replaced by the old .log. And it runs this user, or runs the system in user arrival directory, right? So the whole point here is you can see that the NVStream, SVC, everyone has full access. So we all have full access to that. And then we see that everyone has full access to the NVIDIA Corporation directory. And the reason this matters is that to do a sim link, you have to have um, an empty, the empty directory. So I, I wondered, I was like, okay, if I can delete everything in um, NVStream.SVC, if I can just delete that directory with everything in it, and then create a sim link um, to that file, will it actually work? So you can't, you know, you can't just create a sim link to a directory that has files in it. The directory has to be empty. So you have to be able to have permissions to delete everything out of it. So there's some other interesting vulnerabilities that go into that, but we know that we have access because of these two. So NVStream SVC full access. So we delete NVStream SVC. So then we have this. So then, then we go ahead and we create a sim link. And this was, this is the syntax for that, right? So we're creating a sim link um, to the SAS current dot log to whatever we want, which I did move dot DLL. I don't know why I did that. But that's just what I ended up doing. And um, I create a sim link from SSAS current dot log to move dot DLL. Why is that? I, I think in my head, okay, well, you know that it's writing that file. So during procmon, you know it's like if you restart the service or reboot the box, you know that for the example, like a, a POC or proof of concept, right? Like if this file is seen, so because the sim link's there, uh, the, the service goes, okay, this file is there, but instead of doing the old dot log, it goes move dot DLL in system 32. And that proves because in a basic user context, it proves that I can create a file in system 32, not as an admin, and not a system. So I'm a, I'm a medium integrity, normal user. And, um, because of that, I can, I can, well, not because of that, but because I'm a medium integrity user and it followed my sim links on that service and it created a file in the system 32 directory, then I know that I then have a privilege escalation because a basic user shouldn't be able to write a deal in system 32 and understanding integrity levels is huge here. Like you can see it says system. So like, most, most users at home, if you do a, a who am I slash all, you're going to be um, a medium uh, medium integrity with uh, administrative permission administrator, right? And then when you like right click CMD and do run as admin, you're then, if you do a who am I slash all, you're a high integrity administrator, right? And then and then you can kind of do whatever you want. You can get system easily with like PS exec, whatever you want. But a lot of people don't understand the integrity levels because they'll jump, they'll drop in a box and they're immediately, you know, they'll be in high integrity um, on an op or, or system or whatever. And they, they, especially like they're just throwing internal blue or something like that around. Um, but so that, that's the context here. So medium integrity, not an admin, just basic user, like on a company network. And then you, you figure it out, um, by creating some link, restarting the service. And again, like you could probably work this backwards instead of doing what I did. If someone actually like dove into the code and did some static analysis and then saw that the file was getting replaced by the other file and then both, and then did, you know, I cackles or access checks or whatever, and then saw the permissions. They go, okay. And there's, you know, that's more, you know, high speed, low drag because they're actually like, man, like I looked in the code and I saw this while, while I just ran procmon and watched what was happening <laughs> and goofed around until I got something, which is, you know, it's kind of cool, but, um, these are my references and, um, the, so Google project zero is symbolic link testing. You know, he's amazing. I've already talked about it. Um, the sisternal suite, obviously, and, oh, it man, that's, that's the guy who I was talking about where he had a great write up for, uh, 
escalation of privilege for .NET. Um, and he actually goes like .NET Spy and actually like deep dives on that instead of like all the behavioral analysis that I did. Um, and the, the YouTube channel, that's the one from um, Blue Hat where he talks about the mitigations of uh, cybersecurity, things like that. And um, the, the the next two links are the actual uh, NVIDIA ones where they, they show the CVE and they grade it and the, the actual acknowledgments. Um, yeah, if you and if you enjoyed this talk, and you'd like to know more. Um, you can check out my references on the site earlier. If you have any questions, um, feel free to hit me up. Uh, I, you know, I'll answer any message as long as it's not something like really creepy. Um, <laughs> but that's my Twitter and my email. And um, you know, what I, what I like to end this talk on is that you know companies need to be aware of the stuff when they when they implement new software in their in their company and. Um, when they upgrade or update things that it just, it could open up more vulnerabilities, more possibilities and then like how dumb these logical vulnerabilities are. And like someone does not have to be, you know, a super hacker expert to, to get a basic understanding of, oh man, like a DL is being, being called a system in this user writable directory that like there's ghost DLs and everything like that. And they're just super simple. They've been around a long time, just like uh, unquoted service pass. Um, right, where just things aren't quoted out and there's spaces, and then people replace them in their uh, user writable directories. Uh, but like I said, there's a lot of uh, great researchers who provided their information on the internet. And because of that, I wanted to, you know, give my support, hopefully, and this motivates some people and uh, gets them started on their path of finding vulnerabilities and getting more excited and getting CVEs and. Hopefully my next talk will um, be more on drivers and some sick uh, Windows 10 uh, LPEs. And eventually the next one will be RCEs. It's a dream, uh, one can hope. Uh, I really hope you uh, enjoyed this talk. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And um, again, feel free to reach out to me. All right, thanks.